everyone, and can I welcome members to the 13th uh, meeting in 2017 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private, and it is proposed that the committee takes item nine in private. Item nine is a consideration of the committee's third quarterly report for the parliamentary year 2016 and 17. So does the committee agree to consider item nine in private? Many thanks. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the committee's consideration of the powers to make subordinate legislation conferred on Scottish ministers in the Criminal Finances Bill as amended. The bill is a UK government bill which was introduced in the House of Commons on the 13th of October 2016. Amendments to the bill are currently being considered at report stage in the House of Lords today, having previously been considered at committee stage in that House on the 3rd of April 2017. On the 13th of December 2016, the committee previously considered and reported on the provisions in the bill and a legislative consent motion was agreed by the Scottish Parliament on the 2nd of March 2017. Following the legislative consent motion, further amendments were tabled for consideration in the House of Lords and a supplementary legislative consent motion was lodged on the 30th of March 2017. In lodging the supplementary memorandum, the Scottish Government noted that the timescales for consideration would be tight, as the bill was already at committee stage in the House of Lords. Those timescales tightened further with the announcement of a UK general election on the 8th of June and the consequential dissolution of the UK Parliament thereafter. As a result, it is expected that the bill will now complete its passage through the UK Parliament by tomorrow. To comply with these very tight timescales, the committee is required to consider and report on the LCM today. It is suggested that the committee could be content with the amendments from its perspective. So, does the committee agree to find both the amendments tabled for report stage in the House of Lords on the 25th of April 2000? and 17 to the powers which the bill delegates to the Scottish ministers in clauses 53 and 54 of the bill and the parliamentary procedure to which those amended powers are subject to be acceptable in principle. Many thanks. Does the committee also agree that it is a matter of concern that the parliament has not had a reasonable amount of time to fully scrutinise these changes. In particular, from the perspective of parliamentary scrutiny, it is, is it agreed that it is regrettable that the committee will not be able to avoid publishing its report on the same day that both the amendments are voted on at report stage in the House of Lords and the Scottish Parliament votes on the supplementary legislative consent motion. Are we agreed? Thank you. We now move to agenda item three, which is the Contract Third Party Rights Scotland Bill. And this is our final consideration of oral evidence on the Contract Third Party Rights Scotland Bill at stage one. And it is a very real pleasure to welcome uh, Minister Annabel Ewing, uh, who's the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs to our committee today to take part in this final evidence session. Also a pleasure to welcome Katrina Marshall, Solicitor um, for the Scottish Government Legal Direct Directive, and Jill Clark, uh, who's the Bill Team Leader in the Civil Reform Unit at the Scottish Government. Welcome back, uh, Jill. Uh, and so can I now um, invite questions uh, from my committee. Um, and I have the first question. And the first question is uh, regarding the general benefits of the bill. Uh, so, uh, Minister, if we may... Um, 
The, the first question is, we've heard from various witnesses that the bill will clarify uncertainty in the current law and give parties the flexibility to amend or cancel third party rights. Could you explain why this is important and outline other benefits you think are relevant, please? Yes, thank you, Convener. Good morning uh, and to all the, the members of the committee. Um, I'm pleased to be here today uh, to uh, uh, seek to answer your questions on, on the, the, the bill. With regard to your question, Convener, um, I think it is clear, and I've read all the, the evidence sessions that you have had, I think it is clear that there has been a, a, a lack of clarity in terms of the common law. Uh, and indeed, um, very significant concerns about uh, predictability and flexibility. Uh, and um, I think um, if one reads the, the whole documentation, including the Scottish Law Commission's um, discussion paper of 2014, then the report in 2016, uh, and uh, the submissions that you and the committee have received, I think it is quite clear that what we have seen in Scotland is a, a, a long-standing existence in terms of the law of third-party rights, but an increasing difficulty in having anybody seek to uh, invoke the benefit of Scots law as far as the third-party right is regi uh, regime is concerned. Uh, uh, indeed, in terms of Scots law, I, I, I think it was in the discussion paper of the SLC of 2014 that they, they I think, started with looking back to a case uh, dating back to, I think, 1590 or thereabouts the Moncur case, and I think that suggests that if we are having to look back to a case of 1590, that we might want to have a wee think about whether there might be better ways to do this. But what has grown up in Scotland is a, is a, a body of law uh, driven by, by case law that has presented very serious uh, difficulties uh, in terms of the key issues of clarity and flexibility. Uh, and th those difficulties, uh, in short, uh, involve principally, I, I suppose, the issue of the revocability of the right and the, the, the understanding in Scots law since a, a seminal case in 1920, Carmichael v Carmichael's executrix, that in order to properly confer a third party right, there had to be a revocability. It also went on to say that there had to be a, a, a communication or notification intimation of the right in order to establish the right. But the key issue was that the right had to be irrevocable. Now, in modern day commercial activity in particular, that is a very inflexible position that doesn't make using that law attractive in, in the slightest. Also issues have arisen though as regards clarity in terms of the remedies open to the third party to, in, when enforcing the right, the defences open to the contracting parties when they are seeking to defend uh, a third party claim. The, there is a, an element of a lack of clarity of the, the application of the law of prescription to, to third party rights and so forth. So, um, taking all that in the round, what the result has been, convener, is that uh, uh, people have sought rather to find another way round this. So, I think you've heard significant evidence on what has been termed walk-arounds. So, the two key walk-arounds in this area have been um, either making the third party rights clause in the contract, or indeed the whole contract, subject to English law uh, in terms of their uh, legislation. Uh, or alternatively, uh, uh, or perhaps cumulatively sometimes, uh, having recourse to collateral warranties. Now, I think you've heard a lot of evidence that collateral warranties it's this, uh, involve a very big, long paper chase in many larger transactions where you have unnecessary expense uh, time involved in securing uh, all the, the collateral warranties that are required. Uh, and therefore, there has been a lack of confidence in Scotland in using the third party rights regime as set forth in the common law. Uh, and what this legislation principally is seeking to do is to remove that obstacle to using third party rights law as it is uh, 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 the case in Scotland and has been for many, many centuries. So uh, I think um, having read all this documentation and the, all the arguments of the SLC that's, that have been put forward, I think one could talk all morning about the problems that there have been uh, in uh, using the third party rights common law regime in Scotland, but uh, that's just a flavour of, of the problems that we have seen. And therefore, as I say, what this bill is seeking to do principally is to ensure that that obstacle uh, uh, is removed. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, and I think we largely agree with your aims and objectives. Um, I must say, we will, um, throughout the morning, um, elicit other 
um, statements from you and look forward probably in due course to you bringing forward amendments, but you might want to talk about those uh, as we go through the questions. So I'll now hand over to my colleague, uh, Deputy Convener Stuart uh, McMillan. Um, Stuart, you have some questions, please, for the Minister. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Minister. Um, certainly, uh, you touched upon this a few moments ago with your, your comments uh, just regarding the, the use of, uh, of Scots law. And certainly with the, the policy memorandum uh, for the bill, it states that, uh, that this legislation will actually promote the use of Scots law. And can you uh, uh, outline how this bill will actually achieve this, please? Okay. Um, well, I, what we are doing is, is uh, if the bill is, is passed in committee and in the parliament, what we are seeking to do is provide an option. Uh, it, you will still have um, the freedom to contract in Scotland. That is a fundamental principle of, of, of contract law in Scotland. You will still have freedom to contract and basically within certain uh, overarching limits do, do what you want with your contract. But this provides uh, an option and I think uh, that that will be seen over time. It won't happen overnight, but I think that will be seen over time uh, as uh, uh, helpful and will lead to a change in, in behaviour in terms of how we have approached uh, third party right walkarounds, as I referred to uh, in recent years. So as I say, it won't happen overnight, but I think that will be uh, a change as people see this as a helpful option available uh, to them. I think also, uh, and I think this point emerged from your evidence, uh, to bear in mind is that collateral warranties, uh, aside from the administrative and expense involved in collateral warranties, increasingly I think there are question marks about the scope of collateral warranties, about the enforceability of collateral warranties, and therefore it may be that as these issues come more to the fore that there might also be a need, a need to look at what other options might be available. So I think over time that this will help to, uh, to change the culture of recourse uh, to uh, third party right walkarounds in Scotland, uh, which can only be to the benefit of the, uh, the reputation of Scots law and the uh, accessibility of Scots law for parties in, in Scotland uh, seeking to contract. Okay. No, thank you for that. And certainly in terms of uh, some of the evidence uh, that we have heard, uh, some witnesses suggested that, uh, that law lawyers often choose English law. Uh, when setting up contracts as the, it's been considered to be uh, clearer uh, than Scots law due to uh, England being that bigger uh, jurisdiction and certainly with more cases going through their particular courts. But it's also been suggested that there is that probability uh, that even with uh, the passing of this legislation in Scotland that lawyers will still choose uh, to use the English law. Uh, do you think that uh, there is anything that could actually be done uh, when and if this bill passes uh, in the Scottish Parliament? Do you think there's anything that can be done to, to actually help promote this legislation, uh, to encourage more people, to actually, more lawyers to use uh, Scots law? Yes, I, I think there, there would be a job of work to be done. Uh, I think in terms of ensuring that uh, practitioners in Scotland were aware of the, hopefully at that stage, new legislation uh, and uh, the the um, the alternative therefore that they have at their their disposal and that can be done in a number of ways i would imagine that the law society of scotland uh, would be involved in in uh, information awareness the fact of advocates would have a role i understand that the royal incorporation of architects for example in their evidence to the committee uh, suggested that they would seek to proceed by way of a practice note. Uh, of course, there's our, there are law conferences, I think, just about every day, and that would be an opportunity to ensure uh, that proper uh, awareness uh, was raised about this new option uh, for parties in Scotland seeking to contract in a whole range of fields. It's not just large commercial contracts. It affects, it can affect potentially any anybody and individuals particularly as well. So I think there would be a job of work to be done and obviously we as a government would seek to, to, to facilitate that information uh, awareness raising as uh, carried out by the re relevant professional bodies. Uh, but in the end of the day, as I say, it will be a matter for uh, the parties to the contract to choose how they wish to, to structure their contract and what they wish to do. But what we're trying to do is to say, look, uh, there will be uh, in due course an attractive option for you and, and uh, this is what the option is and you may wish to consider this as a, a actually more cost effective way of, of uh, uh, drafting your contract. So just on, on your point there regarding the, the relevant professional bodies, um, it's, uh, would, the, would the Scottish Government uh, certainly be open to working with the likes of CBI Scotland, FSB Scotland, 
uh, and other non-legal uh, professional bodies to, to help promote yeah. this legislation. Yeah, I mean, too. we, you know, it, once the legislation is passed, it, it doesn't mean that all responsibility is suddenly uh, put to one side. Yes, of course, we we all have an interest if this legislation is passed in ensuring uh, that it is made use of uh, and in whatever way that the government can help to facilitate the actions of, of other relevant bodies, including, as you rightly say, business organisations, then, of course, we would be happy to consider what we could do in that regard. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stuart. Um, can I pass over to Monica Lennon, who's got a series of questions. Monica, thank you, convener. Good morning, Minister. Um, you touched on the benefits to individuals slightly in your answer to Stuart McMillan. Much of the focus when we've been taking evidence so far has been on the benefits to, to the business sector, which is understandable. But could you perhaps say to to what degree the Scottish Government would expect the bill to, to benefit individuals as well as businesses? Yes, I mean, what I can say is, is that the scope is um, not limited to to large corporates. The scope is, is, is uh, there uh, and applies to everybody seeking to contract where the relevance of a third party, conferring a third party right would arise. So, for example, I, I, and, and I think in the evidence, before the committee, um, reference has been made and by the SLC to, for example, holiday contracts where one member of the family will contract uh, uh, the holiday and all the arrangements pertaining thereto and something mega goes wrong, which can happen, and the other members of the family may not have any right of recourse because they have not personally concluded the contract. So that is a very uh, uh, obvious uh, example of, of where getting the the getting the the law uh, accessible to everybody could be a help uh, particularly to individuals i know also the slc have given the example of where you have a situation of an informal carer uh, for uh, an adult who has uh, a mental incapacity uh, and uh, again uh, may contract on on behalf of for the benefit of that incapacitated adult but in the end of the day if there is a problem who, who has suffered the loss, not the informal carer. So that gets you back to the, the, the basic problem of um, where you need to be able to ensure that you can properly confer a third party right that can in fact be uh, uh, invoked and enforced. So these are just two examples, I think, of where we can see already the applicability of this new regime to uh, uh, individual cases and that it would be a benefit to them. Thank you, that's helpful. Some concerns have been raised about the impact of this legislation for smaller businesses. Professor Beale, for example, um, suggested that small businesses may not always realise that the rights of third parties are subject to cancellation or variation, particularly if it's sort of tucked away in, in small print. Is this a matter that the Scottish Government has considered? And if so, does it have any plans to ensure that smaller businesses are properly protected? Um, I, I think whatever the size of your business, I think you would want to ensure if you're entering into to contracts that you know what the contract entails. And usually, uh, and I should perhaps at this say, because I'm not meaning to suggest that this would be the only route, but I am a member of the Law Society of Scotland and I do hold a practicing certificate. And I was about to say that normally the advice would be to seek legal advice, although I'm not practicing, so it's of no personal benefit to me. But um, that would be the normal advice to seek legal advice as to what exactly it is that you're contracting to do. Uh, and I think that is always very important that an individual, a small business, a large business knows exactly what they are signing up to. And uh, there is no shortcut to that. If you feel confident that you can uh, make that judgment yourself without legal advice, well, that would be up to you. But legal advice, I think, would always be helpful in that regard. Um, I mean, I, I've noticed some of the evidence, and indeed, uh, there was a submission from a, a small, uh, well, I'm not saying, well, from a subcontractor. I don't know the size of that subcontractor. And certainly the issue arose as to the feeling that if you're a subcontractor, a smaller subcontractor at the, long end, at the end of a very long chain, uh, uh, then you may not feel you're getting um, an equal say, but I, I would suggest that this is not really within the scope of this bill. That's rather a matter of the rel relative contracting power of each contracting party. Uh, and this bill doesn't impose obligations uh, on third parties. Uh, it simply confers rights on third parties, which uh, actually the third party, of course, is not bound to, to accept. So in that regard, it doesn't, um, it doesn't act to the detriment 
of uh, a smaller subcontractor or, or a smaller business. And I think that's important uh, clarification. Okay, so you see, um, I suppose, benefits in, in having this clarity over, over what the remedies will be? Yes, I think so. I think it's always, uh, because, uh, you know, in, in Broadbrush, uh, it's all very well having a right, but if the right it can't be enforced and B, uh, you can't um, seek a remedy under the law in the exercise of your right, then it, it's, it's perhaps uh, not... Uh, would not be regarded as particularly valuable. So I think it is important that this bill, as I alluded to earlier in my response to the convener, uh, does seek to clarify other issues, includ including the very important issue that the member raises about remedies, uh, and to uh, 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 make clear that the remedies, of course, include also the right to damages, because that was uh, an issue that had been the subject of a, a particular lack of clarity over the many uh, decades and centuries that we have been relying on the common law and uh, third party right regime. Okay. Again, in our evidence sessions, we've um, heard a lot about the use of third party rights legislation in England. Um, we've heard that lawyers in England and Wales have been quite slow to use the equivalent English legislation. And as you already touched on, Minister, they often use workarounds such as collateral warranties instead of third party rights. Um, Again, you said in an earlier answer, um, you think things will take time if this bill is enacted. Um, but do you consider there is a, a similar risk that the same problems will occur in Scotland um, as we've seen perhaps in England? Um, what I would say is that I think it's important to recall that when the uh, 99 Act was introduced for England and Wales, prior to that, there had been no possibility of conferring a third party right. Uh, the, the, under English common law, the, the absolute rule was what's called privity of contract, that your contract was absolutely between the parties to the contract and it had no effect beyond that. And therefore, for England and Wales, the 99 legislation introduced this concept for the very first time. Uh, and uh, I, I would imagine, as a result, it's not simply that you're codifying a right that has existed at common law, you're actually introducing a new right. Uh, and therefore, uh, it may be that there has been a certain... Uh, 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 reluctance to try something new and, uh, 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 and that parties may prefer to, to, to do what they know, which is to go the collateral warranty route in particular. Uh, and, but I understand from reading the evidence as well that th things may be starting to change in England. And as I said earlier, with the uh, slight kind of key question marks now coming in with regard to collateral warranties, in particular with respect to their enforceability, we may continue to see uh, increasing recourse in England and Wales to their legislation. Of course, the position in Scotland is slightly different in that, uh, as I said, we have had a common law regime of third party rights for centuries. Uh, uh, what we have found is that we have had problems in those third party rights actually being uh, the regime being uh, ha ha parties having recourse to our common law regime for the various reasons uh, explained. But we nonetheless have had third party rights as part of our legal system for uh, you know hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of years. And therefore, by codifying our, uh, our law, uh, we're not introducing per se something new. We're simply hoping to make it more accessible to people. And therefore, we start from a slightly different place. Now, whether in the end of the day that that will have a, a, a different uh, result in terms of recourse to our legislation, I think we, we have to, to wait and see. I think we are optimistic that by removing the obstacle uh, to the recourse to our third party uh, law regime that we have seen, that over time and with the information awareness uh, point that Stuart McMillan made, um, that we will see increasing recourse to, to our legislation in the way that I think um, we have uh, seen uh, further to, I think it was this committee's work on the um, legal writings, counterparts and delivery uh, 2015 act. And I think officials have conducted a kind of anecdotal survey which suggests that that is starting to change previous um, requirements in terms of, of uh, ex extensive uh, activity to get a document executed by all parties. So I think we have started to see changes there and we would be hopeful uh, that with this legislation over time we would also see similar uh, changes in terms of increased recourse to our legislation. Thank you. Um
we can tell from your evidence that you believe this legislation would provide a, a helpful option um, to people. Um, what in particular could the Scottish Government do to try and encourage the, the pace of change? I mean, you've mentioned law conferences and there's um, a job of work here for the legal professions, but is there anything in particular that the Scottish Government has considered? We're happy to, to work alongside uh, collaboratively with the, the various professions that are most uh, obviously involved, together with business, the point that Stuart McMillan raised, to ensure that, uh, uh, that you know, parties and practitioners in Scotland know that there is this more accessible uh, uh, option now, or will be if the Act is passed, available to them. Uh, and uh, we are happy to, to consider any particular ideas in, in that regard. Does the Scottish Government quite... Um content to see uh, sort of flexible um, approaches remain. I mean, we took evidence um, from some witnesses from the construction sector, for example, and um, they were positive about this, but they were quite realistic and said that, um, you know, the sort of use of collateral warranties will probably continue. And for lots of clients and um, investors, that would be the sort of, you know, the, sort of the first um, point of call. I'd, are you quite relaxed about that? Um, I think we, we, we accept that in Scotland, uh, uh, as I referred to, freedom of contract is, is an overarching principle of contract law in Scotland, and therefore it is entirely up to the parties uh, to choose how they wish to construct their, their, their own contract in whatever field it is. The role of government is not to come and impose a diktat on how they do that. The role of government is to facilitate options for them to ensure that Scots uh, law, particularly in the commercial field, is, is keeping uh, a pace with... Um, with other uh, jurisdictions uh, and so that people operating here in Scotland, not just in the commercial field, but given that that was the, the, the reference that uh, the member uh, uh, raised, but that they have then uh, this option uh, and uh, that is the way that we would intend to proceed. So there would be no requirement that they invoke this bill, but rather we would hope over time that they would see the advantages uh, of invoking this bill. And uh, I, I think it is fair to say that the more familiar familiarity that practitioners have with the legislation, the more likely it is that they will be uh, uh, at least open to suggesting to their clients that this is something that the client may wish to consider. Uh, so I, I think it is, uh, I think it, we can have grounds for reasonable optimism that this will be legislation that will, over time, be seen as a help in Scots law and not a hindrance. Thank you. Very good. Um, thank you very much. Uh, can I call on David Torrance? Uh, David, you've got some questions, please. Thank you, convener, and good morning, Minister. Um, section 46 of the bill includes rules which stop contracting parties modifying or cancelling a third party right. Could you outline how these provisions will work in practice? Okay, I understand that there has, uh, well, there's been, have been different views expressed about section 46. I think. Um, the, the 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 general view is that uh, they are seen as as um, balanced, uh, and that the objective that the insertion of these provisions is trying to secure is is a, a reasonable objective. And that is, if we go back to the the basic problem that had arisen with regard to recourse to Scots common law in the area of third party rights, that is the issue of irrevocability. Um, it is recognised in the bill, and the bill, it's important to say, is a default setting. Um, parties are still free to contract however they wish, but it is the default setting, and it sits within the framework of Scots, of the general law on obligations and contracts. Uh, but with regard to section 4 to 6, I think it was recognised uh, that uh, it would be helpful to try to strike a balance in terms of giving the parties to the contract the, the right to say that they can modify or cancel the contract, in effect, without the consent of the third party on whom the right had been conferred, but at the same time, try to find a balancing uh, to, to limit that where it would be manifestly unfair. So, for example, one of the examples in, section, in those sections is where the um, third party has actually relied upon the right uh, and that has been known to the contracting parties or they should reasonably have been able to foresee that the third party in the circumstances would rely on that right. Uh, and therefore, it is felt that in terms of setting up the default structure, that it should be uh, a focus of the bill that uh, there should be an attempt to deal with manifest unfairness. Uh, and that is what sections four to six uh, are seeking uh, to achieve. Now, I understand that at certain 
but not all of those who have given evidence have suggested that there may be different terminology that they might wish to see, but it seems that they're not all agreed by consensus on what that different terminology uh, would be. We feel that, and I think one issue that has been raised is um, that the, the, the sections four to six, in the view of, of some, uh, is uh, unnecessarily um, complex. But what we feel is that setting out in codifying the position in legislation and setting up this default position, this has to deal with a multiplicity of possible facts and circumstances. It's not just a question of a simple, oh, you've to pay me a sum of money situation. This has to deal with a whole possible set of circumstances without, with our ken, really, in terms of drafting. And therefore, we have got to endeavour uh, to uh, deal, uh, to anticipate that. And that is why we have been happy to reflect the SLCs carefully, very carefully uh, 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 thought through approach to this issue. And that is why we have set out the uh, provisions in the way that we have. So we feel quite comfortable with the provisions as they're currently set forth. We've heard from Professor Hugh Beale that while the equivalent English provisions are cruder and less sophisticated than the Scottish ones, they're possibly easier to understand. A number of other witnesses have also highlighted concerns about the clarity of Section 4 and 6 of the Bill. Do you think the provisions are sufficiently clear for courts to follow? I do think they are clear. I, I think, as I was trying to, to make the point, that what we're trying to do is to reflect. Uh, first of all, we're, we're also going back to first principles. This bill is codifying hundreds of years of Scots law. So we have had this tradition of third party rights. Uh, and we have to uh, not pretend that we are starting from scratch. We're not starting from scratch. We are codifying what has been a, a, a centuries old uh, element of our legal system. Uh, and therefore, we have to approach it in that way. A, a direct comparison with the provisions of the legislation in England and Wales on any uh, issue, be it on this particular issue or any other issue, is not, I think, making the, the right comparison because we are comparing a piece of legislation which introduced for the first time third party rights into a legal system. And that is not patently the case with regard to this uh, proposed legislation. So we're starting at a different place. And I think we have to reflect that in, in the drafting of our provisions. Uh, and I think that instead of, of seeking to have, to quote Professor Beale, a crude, a cruder version, uh, I'm not entirely sure that that's what we as the government uh, in, in seeking to ensure the integrity of Scots law would be seeking to do as a first choice. I think rather we should seek to, to, to draft the provisions in a way that will hopefully meet uh, what they are, are seeking to achieve, which is to slightly balance this issue of, of uh, fairness in terms of the position of the, the third party. So I hope that's helpful to the member. Thank you, Minister. Good answer. Thank you very much. Um, now move to Alison Harris, who's got a uh, couple of questions. Minister. Alison, please. The Faculty of Advocates has argued in its written evidence that the drafting of Section 9 of the Bill could be improved. What is your view on the faculty's point of view and its suggestions in relation to the redrafting of this section? Yes, good morning. I, I, I'm aware that the faculty has certain concerns about the drafting, albeit not the, 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 uh, the, what the Section 9 is seeking to do, which is to allow uh, th these third party rights to be arb arbitrated. But I do know that they do have some concerns with drafting. We feel quite comfortable that actually uh, the, the drafting reflects the objective being sought. Um, and we're not entirely sure whether there may be some misunderstanding uh, in terms of some of the argumentation put forward by the faculty on this point. What I would say to the member, however, is that if there is uh, clear evidence that there would be a better way to, to achieve uh, the obvious objections of, of Section 9, then of course we'd be happy to, to look at that. But we do feel that we do have uh, the, the drafting right on, on this issue. But, you know, if if there's clear evidence that we need to look again at that, we'd be happy to do that. Thank you. From that point, it would be fair to say, uh, Minister, that we have had a lot of evidence to suggest that um, 
it could be made clearer, um, perhaps more elegant might be another way of putting it, and given your foregoing responses, that you're seeking elegance, obviously. Um, would you be considering bringing forward an amendment in that regard, or the case has not yet been made as far as you're concerned? I, I'm not convinced the case has yet been made, because I understand, and I'll maybe just bring in Joe Clark at this point, because I understand that actually we feel that there's been a certain misunderstanding uh, on the part of those who, who have a problem with the drafting. We don't feel that they've quite understood uh, the, the, the way that Section 9, uh, how it sits in the bill and its interrelationship with other sections, including the key definition section, but perhaps... Uh, joke. Grateful to hear um, from you, Jill. Yes? Yes, I think what the Minister said is exactly right. And I think we'd still like some time to, to work through with the Scottish Law Commission and, in particular, David Bartos, who um, helped them a great deal on their chapter on arbitration, just to work out you know, whether there is a very real issue or not, because we're not convinced at the moment. But as the minister says, um, if if there is an issue, then of course we'll be happy to um, consider an amendment. But we're not quite there yet. Um, so, for, forgive my lack of hearing. So you did say you are in discussion uh, with David Bartos and others in this regard um, yes. at the moment by way of explanation. Right. Um, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Um, now I want to move to section 12.2 of the bill. Um, and section 12.2 of the bill protects existing third party rights acquired before the Act has come into force from abolition. In its written evidence, the law, uh, Shepherd and Wedderburn, argues that the reference to acquired in this section means that existing conditional third party rights may not be protected from abolition as they will not be acquired until the condition is fulfilled which might not happen until the Act has come into force. What is the Scottish Government's view on this um, argument? Yes, I think it was a very good point raised by Shepard and Wedburn, uh, and it is certainly clear uh, uh, that the intention is to ensure that uh, contingent, if you like, conditional uh, use, quotation, terms of third-party rights currently uh, in existence um, are uh, uh, able to be uh, enforced at the time of crystallisation of the right. And it is absolutely not the intention of the bill to do anything uh, that would hinder uh, that. Uh, and therefore, uh, I think that it is uh, uh, clear that we need to reflect further on our drafting on that particular point, because I think the use of the word acquired, uh, whilst uh, clear in one regard, it could perhaps, perhaps benefit from further clarity just to ensure that there is absolutely no dubiety about the fact that these contingent third-party rights are absolutely not affected by currently in existence by uh, this legislation. So it is something that we will be uh, actively looking at. I think I think that would be very welcome. Uh, I must say, from our point of view, and we wouldn't wish to see something that somebody uh, had taken away from them. Therefore, we would want to see them maintained. Um, I now move you on to uh, adjudication, if I may, uh, Minister, and some witnesses have indicated that it might be worth investigating whether the bills, rules and arbitration could be applied to adjudication used in the construction sector. Others have suggested this would be this would overcomplicate and slow down the adjudication process. What is the Scottish Government's views on the concerns raised within the construction industry in relation to the arbitration section of the bill? Uh, yes, I, and uh, further to the evidence provided, uh, uh, I understand officials are currently looking at the issue of the, just to get the, the name right, the housing grants, the adjudication it's process specifically as regards construction in the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act 1996 and that is currently being looked at um, uh, and uh, we will reflect on, on the specific uh, nature of that. I think in terms of adjudication in general, uh, I think the point was made by Hugh and Das that this, uh, if, if this were to be included, uh, if we were to add adjudication, he took the view it would not be necessary and could be confusing and that was uh, as you've alluded to, as against others who felt that this might be something worth looking at. I think an important point to bear in mind in this regard is that adjudication, as far as I understand it, is a, is a temporary uh, process uh, and would lead to either the courts or, or agreement, the courts or arbitration. Uh, so uh, I think that probably was the starting off point in terms of 
the consideration of this issue or one of the points. I, I think also it's important to, to recall why we have a specific reference to arbitration, why it was necessary to have a specific reference to arbitration in the bill, and that is because the 2010 um, Arbitration Scotland Act uh, expressly limits the, the possibility of, of invoking the Act to those parties who, to those who are uh, parties to the arbitration agreement themselves. And therefore, in order to displace, if you like, that provision of that statute, uh, as far as third party rights are concerned in the circumstances set forth, we had to make a, an express reference to the Arbitration Act. Uh, we're not necessarily convinced that that would be the same for other forms of dispute, uh, other dispute re resolution mechanisms. Uh, and therefore, that is why there has not been a reference to other forms in the Act, but we are reflecting on that point just to ensure that we have uh, uh, the Act, in, in the legislation rather, in the, in the best, um, uh, drafted in the best way possible to not inadvertently uh, exclude those uh, proceedings which could be included. Excellent. I think that's uh, certainly what we would want to hear in that regard, and that's still, if you like, a work in progress. So uh, thank you for that, Minister. Um, now move to the human rights uh, element on, of this b bill. Uh, call on Alison Harris again, please. Alison. The policy mem memorandum explains that the bill complies with Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights on the right to a fair trial, as it gives third parties a choice of using arbitration. Can you expand on why the bill complies with the Convention? Um, well, I, the, the presiding officer has uh, uh, ruled that the bill is within scope, so I wouldn't want to second-guess the presiding officer. Uh, uh, but I think, it, it, just for clarity, I, I think the point being, being um, raised here uh, is the issue of um, whether you can um, be forced, if you like, to give up your otherwise your recourse to, to, to the, the courts. And uh, in terms of the arbitration provisions, it is clear, and going back to first principles about conferring a third party right, you are um, conferring a right. You cannot impose an obligation. You can't impose a requirement for a party to proceed with arbitration. You can simply uh, facilitate it, and it would be up to the party to choose to do so or not, and therefore waive in that instance their rights to the courts. So that is why, at its essence, given there is no compulsion, there is no breach of the Article 6 right. Thank you. I think um, that's very welcome, and I would certainly want you to be absolutely clear in that regard, because where the Parliament has tripped up, as you'll be well aware, in, in over the last number of years has been this removal of the element of choice, uh, which has seemed to where we've fallen foul. Um, so if, as long as we're not removing choice, then... Is arbitration, but the third party can't be. Going back to first principles, uh, conferring a third party right is is simply that you cannot uh, impose an obligation on the third party in your contract. You you can't do that. It is up to the third party to accept the right or not. The third party doesn't need to accept a right. Uh, in terms of the first element of the arbitration provision, uh, it is clear that. Um, in terms of the right being uh, uh, conferred, part of that package is or could be that the matter would be, uh, if the in event of dispute, would be subject to arbitration. But the third party in accepting the right is accepting the package, and that is the, the key issue. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Alison. Um, now move to Stuart Macmillan. Um, <coughs> Mr McMillan, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, Minister, earlier on in your comments, when you spoke about the third party uh, rights and uh, the length of time that it's actually been in operation in Scotland, it's going back hundreds of years. Um, it's, I mean, I'm certainly not going to argue with you uh, in that particular area. Um, the, some of the evidence that we've received uh, has highlighted, though, that, uh, that there has been an issue with uh, third party rights in Scotland since the, uh, the Second World War. And do you think that, the, that there actually is an argument that the, the pace of reform uh, in, in the law reform area uh, has actually been too slow? Um, in an ideal world, I guess, um, one would like to see a, a, a lot of activity in a lot of fronts. But realistically, particularly taking into to account complex areas of the law, I mean, you, you want to get it right and you want to have discussion. And I think that's what the SLC has done with regard to this complex area of the law. Uh, they have uh, proceeded 
uh, with uh, extensive consultation. They have carefully considered the responses received. They have then proceeded with a draft. They have had further discussions on particular issues. Uh, and uh, then we now have the stage one evidence session with the minister today. So I think we would all like to see things happen more quickly in life. But I think realistically, uh, in very complex areas of civil law particularly, um, there is a, a process to be followed. And the, the, the point of the process would be to ensure that we get the best piece of legislation that our collective endeavours can possibly arrive at. And I think the prize is therefore worth uh, a wee bit more of a delay. But I understand that this Scotland is not unique in this regard. And I think uh, one of the evidence sessions suggested that actually uh, it for the English and Welsh legislation 99, I think there, were, there was a reference to perhaps first possible mootings of doing something before the Second World War. So I think, you know, things tend to move uh, not as quickly as maybe um, the general public would, would like to see, but as a matter of, of uh, getting it right, uh, uh, I think it is important to proceed uh, without undue, undue haste. But of course, we can always strive to, uh, to, to do things better. Okay, thank you. And the, um, certainly an issue that uh, arose in the, uh, some of the evidence sessions uh, was that regarding the, the black hole of non-liability and something that's come up by, uh, by some witnesses. And uh, we understand that the, the SLC uh, is actually considering uh, this issue uh, separately. Now, certainly uh, one of the, the things that have come up regarding this is just in terms of the SLC and its activity. Um, it's, it seems to have been upon individual areas of law, but in terms of the, the, the whole process of law reform, uh, is there a, an argument that, uh, that law reform could actually be speeded up uh, if uh, further law reform bills actually incorporate more than just one specific area uh, of, of the law? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I, I guess that's one possible way. Um, of course, I think we have seen both at Westminster, when Westminster still legislated exclusively in the area of, of Scots civil law, um, and indeed in this parliament in terms of some bills, that once you have an omni bill, uh, things can get a bit rushed and difficult. And, and instead of there being a focus, a clear, straightforward focus on the matter at hand, you get all these bits added, you have unintended consequences, something else needs to be added at the last minute to deal with something else that you've included earlier on. And it beca could become a bit of a hodgepodge. So I think you've got to have a balance of of uh, proceeding in an orderly fashion, but also um, respecting the interests of the public in ensuring that we uh, maintain our legal system in an effective and accessible way for the benefit of all of our citizens. So I think there's a balance, but it's an interesting question and uh, one that I can uh, pursue further w in my next meeting with, with Lord Pentland, perhaps. But I, I think one should... Just bear in mind that the, the, the wider the reach of the bill in terms of the uh, bringing in within its scope a whole series of not necessarily in, interlocked issues raises issues in terms of how that bill then ends up further to its parliamentary handling. So there's no, there's no ideal uh, solution to, uh, to the issue at hand, but we certainly we are encouraged to, to note that uh, the, the SLC is proceeding with its next um, programme of reform. I think they were just about They're to about announce to that. that yes. tomorrow. But I mean, th this yeah. bill and probably the legal writings bill are a good example of something that's from a, a you know a big contract framework that, that the SLC are looking at. So if you wait till they concluded all of that, we'd be waiting even longer for, for law reform to happen. But by breaking it down into kind of these bite-sized chunks, at least something's happening and improvements are being made. And it's you know, we would just wait longer, I think. But their, their programme for, for the 10th programme of law reform launches tomorrow. So. Uh, yes, well, certainly on the, the legal writings, I was on the committee that looked at that um, as well. And um, I, I think the point regarding the, the bite-sized chunks I think is, is well made. Um, the, I think the, the maybe the, the potential uh, going forward uh, without having a, a bill that is overarching, uh, but maybe to have maybe two or three bite-sized chunks, uh, if they are compatible, I think might be uh, something worth considering. 
uh, as compared to just individual bite-sized chunks going forward. Well, exactly. I mean, it's a, uh, you know, and each each uh, instance would depend, I suppose, uh, on on the facts and circumstances of what you were seeking to do and what possible things could be combined. But it's certainly an issue I'm happy to to raise in my next uh, meeting with Lord Pentland, which I don't know when it's set for, but I'm sure it's soon. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, is anyone any further supplementary questions for the Minister? And if not, then it just remains for me to thank the Minister uh, and Joel Clark and Katrina Marshall for accompanying her today uh, and for giving us um, your evidence so elegantly, Minister. So thank you very much indeed. Um, we will now reflect on what you have said and look forward to the Stage 1 process continuing. Thank you very much. Can I now just suspend the meeting for a moment while... Okay, um, everyone, shall we um, start again? And we move now to agenda item four, which are instruments subject to affirmative procedure, and no instrument, uh, no points rather, have been raised by our legal advisers on the draft Apologies Scotland Act 2016 Accepted Proceedings Regulations 2017. So, is the committee content with this instrument? Thank you very much. Um, moving now to agenda item five, instrument subject to negative procedure. And the next instrument for consideration is the Electricity Works Environmental Impact Assessment, Scotland Regulations 2017, SSI 2017, number 101. And the purpose of these regulations is to update and replace the Electricity Works Environmental Impact Assessment, Scotland Regulations 2000 in order to implement Directive 2014-52 EU on the assessment of the effects of certain public and private projects on the environment. The committee notes that the meaning of Regulation 31C could be clearer if the provision referred to the consultation bodies as defined in Regulation 21, rather than those authorities as drafted. This is particularly the case as no authorities appear to be referred to in Regulation 31C. So, and accordingly, does the committee agree to draw the instrument to the attention of Parliament on ground H as the meaning of Regulation 31C could be clearer? Thank you. The committee also notes that there are errors in Regulations 13.5b, 18.1, 29.3 and 34 that are all similar in nature. These provisions all fail to properly cross-reference other provisions either in the same instrument or in other regulations which have been acknowledged by the Scottish Government. So on that basis, does the committee also agree to draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament on the general ground, as the regulations contain the following minor drafting errors related to cross-referencing? Firstly, Regulation 13.5b refers to Regulation 11.1 of the Environmental Information Scotland Regulations 2004, but it was intended to refer to Regulation 11.2 of those regulations. Secondly, under Regulation 
Now, secondly, Regulation 18.1 refers to a notice published under Regulation 21.1, but it was intended to refer only to Regulation 14.2c. Thirdly, Regulation 29.3 refers to particulars in paragraph 2c, but it was intended to refer to paragraph 2a. And fourthly, Regulation 34 refers to Regulation 30 to 32, but it was intended to refer to Regulations 31 to 33 on electronic communications. The committee notes that the Scottish Government intends to bring forward an amending instrument to rectify the errors in the regulations identified above. So does the committee agree to welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to bring forward an amending instrument? Many thanks. The next item for consideration is the Town and Country Planning Environmental Impact Assessment Scotland Regulations 2017, SSI 2017, number 102. <laughs> And the purpose of these regulations is to update and replace the Town and Country Planning Environmental Impact Assessment Scotland Regulations 2011, SSI 2011, number 139, to implement certain provisions of the Directive 20, 2014, number 52, EU. Like the Electricity Works Environmental Impact Assessment Scotland Regulations 2017, SSI 2017 number 101, the committee notes that these regulations raise a matter of drafting clarity. Specifically, with regard to Regulation 42.1c, it would be clearer if the provision referred to the consultation bodies as defined in Regulation 2.1, rather than those authorities as drafted. Accordingly, does the committee agree to draw the regulations to the attention of Parliament on ground H, as the meaning of Regulation 42.1c could be clearer? Thank you. The committee also notes that the instrument contains some minor drafting errors which have been acknowledged by the Scottish Government. So does the committee therefore agree to draw the regulations to the attention of Parliament on the general reporting ground in light of the following minor drafting errors? Firstly, Regulation 196B refers to Regulation 11.1 of the Environmental Information Scotland Regulations 2004, but it was intended to refer to Regulations 11.2 of these re regulations. Secondly, there is an error in Schedule 6, revocations in the citation of the waste, meaning of hazardous waste and European waste catalogue, miscellaneous amendments, Scotland Regulations 2016, as they are the 2015 regulations. Again, the committee notes that the Scottish Government has confirmed that it intends to bring forward an amending instrument to make the changes to Regulations 196B and 421C. So does the committee agree to recommend that this planned amendment should also correct the error in Schedule 6? Many thanks. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the flood risk management, flood protection schemes, potentially vulnerable areas and local plan districts, Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017, SSI 2017, number 112. So is the committee content with this instrument? Thank you. Final instrument for consideration in instruments not subject to any parliament procedure is the Act of Sederant uh, Fatal Accident Inquiry Rules 2017, SSI 2017, number 103. The purpose of the instrument is to set the procedural rules that apply in the Sheriff Court in relation to fatal accident inquiries. This follows the enactment by the Scottish Parliament last year 
of the inquiries into fatal accidents and sudden deaths, etc., Scotland Act 2016. The committee notes that Rules 1, 2, 1 and 3.5 and Paragraph 19 of Schedule 4, as currently drafted, appear to be defective. Accordingly, does the committee agree to draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament on ground I in respect of the following instances of defective drafting? Firstly, the definition of apply and related expressions in Rule 1.21, which means to apply in accordance with Schedule 1, does not provide for an exception where the context requires otherwise. This is despite the instrument containing a number of references to apply and related expressions that are not intended to engage the procedure in Schedule 1. In addition, the procedure in Schedule 1 incorrectly applies in relation to Rule 3.5 in connection with a person who is not given notice of an inquiry under Section 17.1 of the Fatal Accidents and Sudden Deaths, etc., Scotland Act 2016, but who wishes to apply. Also, paragraph 19 of Schedule 4 incorrectly includes in the definition of legal representative a person having a right to conduct litigation or a right of audience by virtue of Section 27 of the Law Reform Miscellaneous Provisions, Scotland Act 1999. So, in addition, our legal advisor... Thank you. So, do we agree to report that? Forgive me for not asking you that. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, um, you. In addition... Our legal advisers have also raised a number of minor drafting errors. Uh, does the committee therefore agree to draw the instrument to the attention of Parliament on the general ground as the instrument contains the following minor drafting errors? Rule 4.84 4 refers to the fees payable under paragraph 2, but it was intended to refer to paragraph 3. Form 3.1 in Schedule 3 does not reflect Rule 3.1 to F, insofar as it does not provide for the first notice to be to set out in the case of a discretionary inquiry under Section 6 of the 2016 Act, which condition in Section 6.3a of that Act is met. The signing block in Form 7. Point, in Form S4.7 in Schedule 3 is missing. The heading of Form S5.5C in Schedule 3 does not reflect that the form can be completed by the participant who obtained an order for recovery of documents in terms of Paragraph 5.3B of Schedule 5. And Paragraph 5.1B of Schedule 5 refers to a participant ex executing commission and diligence under paragraph 4, but it was intended to refer to paragraph 6. The Lord President's private... Thank you. <laughs> Forgive me. Uh, so are we agreed um, to report those as well? Thank you. Um, the Lord President's private office has undertaken to rectify, you will be pleased to note, all of the errors identified at the next available opportunity, which will be considered in light of the meeting timetable of the Scottish Civil Justice Council. So does the committee agree to welcome that the Lord President's private office has undertaken to keep the committee informed of this? Thank you. In addition, with a view to clarifying the correspondence with the Lord President's private office, does it also agree to recommend that the proposed amendments should also include inserting a signing block in Form S4.7 within the schedule? Many thanks. So we'll now move to Agenda Item 7, which concerns the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill. 
and it is the consideration of the committee's approach to the delegated powers provision in the bill. The powers are limited to ancillary and commencement powers. It is suggested that the committee could be content with the powers. So does the committee agree that it is content with the powers in the bill and to prepare a stage one report in this regard? Many thanks. Uh, I now move the meeting into private.